Thank you. Um, yeah, it seems to be a new setting on uh, on recording. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Apologies for the delay in uh, in joining, and also for the uh, interruption for a couple of weeks. Thank you for your understanding. Um, I also want to just thank Adam for, uh, as always, coordinating things in uh, in my absence, and um, thank you to Philip for what I heard was a wonderful tabura. Um, I haven't yet managed to hear the recording, but uh, I look forward to uh, to listening to it. And I apologise in advance if there's some overlap with what I'm saying, but uh, I, I really, just for the sake of completion, wanted to still give a share on this uh, sukya, um, after which we will move on to the new sukya. So on uh, um, Tuesday, we will start the next uh, sukya. So I, I think we've had a, a long delay in this uh, in this topic through, uh, through no one's fault. But the next sukya we'll start will be after the two dots of Hatsad Khilazun. And uh, I must tell you in advance, there's an enormous amount to see on the sukya. It's a, it's a massive sukya. It's really a, a summary of, uh, of a, a whole chunk of Masechus Shabbos. Um, but for Tuesday, just to start with the Gemara and Rashi and Toastas, and the Toastas alone probably is enough to keep us all busy for, for at least a couple of learning sessions. Um, so for Tuesday, I will not give out sources other than to save the Gemara, Rashi and Toastas. And then after that, I'll give out Mara Makomans, which are, are, are vast. It's a very, very important and uh, massive uh, sukya. Um, but just for the sake of completion, to finish off our topic, our sukya, um, the Gemara tells us that uh, brings a statement, another statement of Rav Zutra Batsuvya Omarav, that uh, that someone who knows how to be mechashev uh, to kufus and mazoris. To kufus are the um, either translators the seasons or the different positions of the sun in the sky, which are really the same thing. The sun moves its position in the sky throughout the seasons. And Mazolos, the, the zodiac, the different positions of the um, of uh, um, the stars, the different uh, um, star bodies of stars, which again really is linked to seasonal changes in different seasons. Um, different uh, star systems are there around the time of uh, summer, of, of sunset and nightfall, which is why um, different months have different signs of the zodiac associated with them. Um, if someone knows how to engage in these calculations and doesn't do so, then he is, um, he, one shouldn't engage with him, this is a bad person. And then the Gemara carries on and brings various other memories around this topic, um, the most extreme of which uh, seems to say this Chag Misa, and the Gemara seems to bring there's a mitzvah to do these calculations based on the Pasuk of Ki Chachmaschem or Vinaschem Ha Ha'amim. So this is a summary of the Gemara. Now, the reason the Sukkah comes here in Derech Shat is simply because this is another member of Zutra Batsuvya, and this is the way of the Gemara, that when one has a relatively rare Amora, um, one brings uh, um, uh, memories from these Amoras, one brings many statements from this Amora and collates um, anything this Amora says. So since Rav Zutra Batsuvya is a relatively uh, unknown Amora, the Gemara collates various statements that he made. Um, I, I printed in the, um, I didn't print this in the source sheet, but I put it on the WhatsApp group just for those who are interested. Um, the Miyuchas Laran, which is, uh, means to say that the commentary is scribed to the run, but that currently um, academics do not think is really the run himself. So it's gone down in history as the Miyuchas Laran, the commentary is scribed to the run, quotes the view of Rabbeinu Yonason. Rabbeinu Yonason was a Russian from the south of France, from Provence, and he happens to mention as an aside that the reason why one should know how to do these astronomical calculations is because through so doing, one recognizes the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, um, and one has an answer to the Apikoros and the Mogush. In other words, it would appear that the Mogush, the Magus that we learned in the previous Sabya, used to engage in astrology and use this as a way of denying the authority of the monotheistic of the one God. And therefore, this is a response to the Mogush. This is how he links these uh, different members of uh, Rav Zutra Batuvia. Um, be that as it may, what's the pshat in the sukya? Um, what, what is this chishuv of tukufus and mazalus, and why should one engage in it, and what is the halachic obligation to so do? So this is what I want to really cover in the she, just pshat in the, in, in the sukya, and what the mitzvah to engage in it is. So Rashi tells us that the mitzvah is, because this is a chokhmah, um, in which one can show people how um, one can visibly and viscerally demonstrate um, one's ability to engage with serious knowledge of creation. Because one who understands the Tukufus and Mazonus is able to predict the weather and the, um, the fortunes of the next year, 
And therefore, being able to uh, do so will demonstrate our wisdom. We'll say this year is going to be a, a rainy year or a dry year. And then indeed, that's what happens. And one is able to demonstrate um, one's mastery of the secrets of creation. So Rashi's Peshat is that this has nothing to do with astronomical observation needed for halachic reasons, like uh, the functioning of the calendar. This is simply using um, uh, astronomy to understand the uh, future um, of the world, the uh, scientific functioning of uh, the seasons, and therefore to be able to, for example, make predictions about the weather. The Marshal already explains Rashi. He says Rashi is not willing to learn that this is um, uh, anything to do with um, the, the calendar function, because the calendar, by and large, actually doesn't work through the seasons and the mazalas. The primary vehicle of the calendar is the Levana, the moon. And that's a separate mitzvah, that's the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh. That's got nothing to do with our sugya. You don't need a sugya that tells you about astronomical and astrological observations. That's the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh, that's based on the moon. This is a separate uh, topic. So this is how Rashi learns the sugya. Mahalach number one in the sugya is that it's referring to astronomical or astrological observations used to predict the future. And this is um, a science of sorts, and it's a way of demonstrating our uh, wisdom. The Miyuchus Luran, which I mentioned previously, also seems to learn this way. He stresses that we Jews don't believe that the sun and the moon and the stars, the stars, have the ability to control existence. God forbid to think that we should read the stars because somehow they are forces which determine what will happen. That's not the case. That would be avodos kachavim or mazolos, worship of the of kachavim of the stars and the zodiac mazolos, which is another way that we talk about idol worship. However, it is a scientific fact. So says um, the miyuchas the rabbeinu in the sun that the vehicle through which Hashem runs the world are the mazolos, and therefore, if we're able to read the mazolos, we're able to predict the future. So even though in modernity we don't uh, understand these ideas and we don't follow them, this would be akin to the distinction between pagan worship and science. It's not pagan worship to analyze weather patterns and use that to predict the weather. It's simply an understanding of the forces of nature. And if we understand the forces of nature, then we're able to predict more or less successfully what the weather might be like at some point in the future. Or climate predictions, we understand the um, effect of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and therefore make predictions about what the weather might be like in 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years time. So this is simply engagement in um, what was considered to be a scientific analysis of the world, which in those days they understood to be Kachov and Martellus. No one who engages in science it believes that the physical properties of the universe have um, determinative power. They are simply vehicles to which, if we believe in Hashem as the Bo'olam, Hashem expresses himself and controls the world. And therefore, similarly, the Mazolus were understood in Jewish theology to be a similar idea. They are the vehicles scientifically do that which the world is controlled. It becomes paganism, it becomes us if you're using these things and you think they have a determining factor, a, a, a genuine influence. If one understands them as the vehicle through which the world is controlled, then Adarabha, on the contrary, learning them is a demonstration of our wisdom because um, it's, it's a scientifically determinate fact. If you show people that we have such an insight into understanding the Kachovim and Manzolas, that we can predict what the weather will be like next year, then that is a Kiddush Hashem. It is a, um, a fulfillment of this positive of of showing how Torah um, is able to um, influence, is able to determine even on a physical level what will happen. And this is the ultimate answer to the Apikoros and the Magus, the, the Magus who believe that stars have their own free will and their own ability to determine the future of life. Um, so Muhammad number one in the Gemara is that we're referring to um, the scientific observation of astronomical bodies in order to determine and predict what the future will bring. In modern terminology, we would say understanding of the forces of nature and science to understand how the world works. Sorry. When our, when our predictions fail, wouldn't that be a chilol Hashem? I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm stating our Rashi learns the Gemara. I, I don't know what to make of um, astronomical and astrological belief um, and, and what was meant by that. Was this meant literally? Was this meant metaphorically? I, I, I have no comments on this matter. Um, but you're correct. I mean, it, it would appear it, it's, it's not something we currently understand and, and have the insight into. Um, but it, it would appear that an application of this would be in modernity that, that we should have some scientific understanding and an ability to, to understand how the world, uh, the world works. And perhaps if one, if one assigns probabilities, you could resolve it. One could say, you know, this is uh, more likely to happen when we've done this, we've done this calculation. Maybe, I don't know.
Um, look, I, I mean, I, I use weather forecast as an example, but for reasons which are now well understood scientifically, chaos theory, um, it's very hard even to assign probability to, to weather predictions beyond uh, a couple of weeks. And because the, the, it becomes so complicated that, um, that, that uh, yeah. you know, um, human society and you know, actuaries are able to, to crunch the statistics to some degree when it comes to uh, um, sociology and to predictability of you know, natural disasters and the like. But it's beyond statistical calculation, even to predict the exact weather two weeks off because of the complexity of these things. So I, I don't know really what Rashi is referring to. Um, but the, the broad mahalach of Rashi is one that we can say that this is how Rashi learns the sugya. So, so far we have one mahalach. Uh, sorry, so you're kind of just kind of taking modern science and just kind of translating it into like a, you're saying the astrology or astronomy that they had was like a pseudoscience that we know better than that or whatever it might be. But it was still a science in the sense that they're trying to understand how the world works. But you're saying that that's distinct, and what they're not talking about is some sort of magic where there's their their kind of there's control of the world through kind of trans transcendental forces or whatever. C correct. If you believe in the stars as having a a sort of pagan um, um, polytheistic ability to actually affect change in the world, then you're on Ovid Chavim Marzolis. If you believe in the stars as a natural force through which Hashem operates and runs the world, then that's simply equivalent to believing in the laws of science. That that, that seems to be the distinction that they're making. Making. It's just interesting to compare that to what we were saying in the last mini, well, the last part of the sugya about about magic. And... The, it's, that, that was really my question that I asked. What determines magic? Well, it's just another force of nature. And the answer was because there you're trying to control things, and you believe that there's ways to circumvent the rocks and Hashem through 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 cheap and swift manipulation. However, if you understand that there's a scientific system through which the world operates, whether that's modern laws of science or, or the stars, then that's simply the, the, the sort of scientific mechanism through which the world runs. And that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be uh, problematic. It's the cheating of the system that's so problematic. I, I should say that, that for any of you who follow the sort of Jewish blogosphere, you're probably aware that there's a lot of talk in, in recent years about rationalist Rishonim versus mystical Rishonim and, and so on. And that, that there's a lot of cloudiness around these concepts because a, a lot of what we consider to be rational or mystical is, 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 is determined really by, by a, a particular era in history that we're living in of, of a, with a certain sort of assumption about how the world works. And these things are not, um, this is not, uh, this is what I'm saying is, is not a sort of a, a controversial point. It's, it shouldn't be controversial. It's a very classic in science and philosophy. It, it's not clear at any stage in time to work out what exactly we mean by, by rational. Um, and I'll give an example from classic Jewish thinkings and then just very briefly in, in modern, modern philosophy. Um, in classic Jewish thinking, a, a common divide is, is, as I said, between the rational and mystical Rishonim. And Ibn Ezra very much falls on the, on the philosophical and rational side, um, very, very clearly so. Nonetheless, Ibn Ezra very firmly brought into, brought into astrology and belief in, in the influence of stars on human fate. And um, we may look at this and say, well, this is a mystical belief, this is an uh, anti-rationalist, anti-scientific belief. But we need to ask ourselves, what, what, what actually told someone in the 1100s or 1000s that this was non-scientific? There was a belief that the stars had an influence on how the world works. Um, the truth is we also believe that to this day. We believe that a, a star um, 15 million light years from planet Earth has some tiny effect on the gravitational field on Earth. Right? We believe that a supernova exploding in space um, you know, five million light years away, uh, a particle, an alpha particle, can escape from the supernova, travel through space for seven million years, penetrate the vacuum of Earth, trigger a mutation in a cell, and have a terrible impact on, on the health of a human being, um, you know, seven million years after the supernova exploded. So what exactly is, is irrational and rational about this? It, it, it is correct that at the moment now we don't believe in this, and, and presumably that's the case, I have no reason to doubt this idea, but the idea that somehow there was something uh, out, out unscientific about this belief is simply not the, the case. Moving to modern times, um, in the year 1920, um, in the year 1906, let's say, everyone believed in a, in a deterministic, um, Newtonian, clockwork-like universe. And for 300 years, that had been the reigning scientific orthodoxy, as per Newton, that everything follows a mechanical system. With 1906 and the beginning of the breakdown of that um, through, through relativity, and certainly when it came to quantum mechanics and the like, 
we realize we don't live in a mechanical deterministic universe. And Einstein himself was bothered by this. He spoke about this spooky action from the distance. He believed that quantum mechanics had become mystical. And he said, this is irrational. You're dissolving in mysticism, in which there's a fundamental non-predictability about the universe, in which human consciousness seems to be able to change reality. And yet this has become the scientific orthodoxy. That's of, you know, 2021. And the scientific orthodoxy is we live in a very mysterious universe in which there is spooky, ac um, a, a, a spooky um, influence or action from the distance, in which human consciousness does seem to determine the nature reality so, so what's called rational and irrational in, in eras change um and at least uh, as, as rashi learns as gemara seem to understand that um stars are somewhat analogous to what we nowadays would call the forces of nature and science and can be used to uh predict the future not in a uh, pagan way but simply in a scientific way of understanding how they are operating so this is shit russian um a second malach in the sukya is from the Miri. The Miri is also from Provence, very influenced by the rationalism of the Ramam, and seemingly not a believer in even this modified version of astrology. And the Miri says the reason there's a mitzvah to engage in this is because this is a wonderful science. Humans should learn the flores abara, they should work, learn the beauty of nature and the phenomenal uh, actions of nature. And um, the Miri was aware, for example, that eclipses were predictable events, and that's one of the examples he gives. He says, the Dias Osis of Shemaim, the Lakas Samaoris, the eclipses of the heavenly bodies. And he says to learn science and understand uh, the heavenly bodies and their functioning and the maths behind them and the uh, um, and so on, how, how they all work below Shagia, they work in a completely mechanical way with no mistake and no error and are absolutely um, sort of systematic in how they operate. This is part of the Nifloi Saboro that one should learn. And uh, doing so is a Kiddush Hashem because, again, it, it shows our Chochman, our Bina. Um, so this is a second mahalach in the sugya. Um, a third um, pathway through the sugya, a third way of learning the sugya, is the machlokas between the Rambam and the Bahag, which I printed in um, source two. So um, I printed these sources at length because they are absolutely fascinating. I don't, I don't have time to go through them in too great length, but very briefly, just to give the background. The Rambam, as we know, wrote his Sefer HaMitzvahs, his list of 613 mitzvahs. He was um, preceded in his attempt to count the 613 mitzvahs by the Bahag, who was uh, um, uh, a figure from the era of the Ga'onim, so um, uh, uh, a couple of hundred years before the Rambam, who also listed the 613 mitzvahs. Now, we may think it's a relatively easy, easy task to list the 613 mitzvahs, but truth is a very difficult endeavor. Um, not necessarily because of halachic confusion, though that could be a factor, um, is something a mitzvah or not, but even when something is a mitzvah, what, what numbering do you give to it? So, for example, to fill in Shalrosh and to fill in Shalyad, to fill in on our heads, to fill in on our, on our arms, is this two mitzvahs or one mitzvah? And tzitzis, you can do tzitzis without tzicheles, as, as nowadays, unfortunately, um, according to most post that that is the way you perform the mitzvah. Or we can do tzitzis with tzicheles, as they were able to do in the past, and according to some post we're able to do again now. Are these two mitzvahs or one mitzvah? Is there one mitzvah of tzitzis? Well, no, two mitzvahs, where tzitzis with white strings, and where tzitzis with the addition of tzicheles, if you're able to obtain tzicheles. So how you count the mitzvahs is, is somewhat a matter of counting, rather than necessarily always a halachic debate. Now, without going into too much detail, the Raman wrote an introduction to his work of Sefer Mitzvahs, in which he called them shroshim, or foundations, or roots, in which he explained the criteria of how he determined what is a mitzvah or isn't a mitzvah. And the first principle the Rambam established is that a mitzvah drabonon should not be included in the 613, count of the 613 mitzvahs, because it's a rabbinic mitzvah, not a Torah obligated mitzvah. This may sound non controversial, but of course, 630 mitzvahs commanded us by Hashem. How can you count drabonons? However, the Rambam's predecessor, the Bahag, did indeed list rabbinic mitzvahs in his list of 613 mitzvahs. And why he chose to do so again is a broader discussion. For those who are interested in my Sunday morning series on philosophy, um, I dealt recently at great length with Torah Shemal Peh and how to understand your Rabbonons and touched on this issue of why the Bahag lists rabbinic mitzvahs. Either way, the Bahag lists rabbinic mitzvahs and the Ramam says, one would say nowadays non-controversially, no, the 600,000 mitzvahs have to be Torah mitzvahs. But then the Ramam says something else. The Ramam also says that mitzvahs which are derived only from a drosha, they're not explicit in the text or explicit in the oral tradition, but they're derived from a drosha, a hermeneutical reading of the text through a Gezerah Shava or a Kalmah or the like. These also shouldn't be counted in the 613 mitzvahs. Why did the Ramam adopt this stance? Because the Ramam believed that droshas are human generated. 
It is true we derive them from the text of the Torah, but since they are human generated, they also can't be counted in the 630 mitzvahs. And this is a more controversial stance than Rambam, which again, I addressed in my Sunday morning series when we were looking at what the oral Torah is, what Torah Shemal Peh is. So, so far the Rambam has told us two principles. Don't list rabbinic mitzvahs, and don't list mitzvahs which are derived from a drasha but are not explicit in the Torah. Based on this, the Rambam attacks a large number of mitzvahs which the Bahag lists. And for the purposes of our discussion, one is of particular interest, because the Bahag lists, indeed, a mitzvah to calculate to kufus and mazonas, this mitzvah of calculating the seasons. And the Rambam says it shouldn't be listed. It is true it is a mitzvah, but it is a mitzvah which is not explicit in the Pasuk, but is derived from interpretation of the Pasuk. The Pasuk doesn't say calculate to kufus and mazonas. The Pasuk merely says, Ki vasisem, you should guard and do something. What's the something? Ki it doesn't tell us what this is. We derive that this refers to the science of Tukufus and Mazonas, and therefore this isn't a mitzvah in our Torah. This is a mitzvah derived from Drosha, from Drash, and therefore shouldn't have been listed in the 13 hermeneutical principles. Fascinatingly, that means to say that both the Rambam and the Bahag agree it's a mitzvah. They're simply arguing whether it is a mitzvah from Torah law or a mitzvah derived and counted amongst the 613 or a mitzvah from a drosha and therefore not counted amongst the 613. <coughs> now the commentaries on the Rambam ask a question. If the Rambam is indeed be of belief that this is a mitzvah, albeit not one of the 613 commandments, where does the Rambam tell us about this mitzvah? Nowhere does the Rambam tell us about such a, uh, a mitzvah. No one does the Rambam say there's a mitzvah to calculate these things. And they leave this as a question on the Rambam. I think the answer to the Rambam is the Mi'iri. What is this mitzvah of calculating to Kufus and Mazaras? So if you learn like Rashi, that it is to understand the zodiac and the astronomy and astrological signs in order to predict the future, then indeed it's a question, why does the Rambam not list this as a separate mitzvah? But as is well known, the Rambam didn't believe in these things. What did the Rambam believe in? In studying nature in order to achieve Ahavas Hashem. <coughs> the Rambam writes this explicitly in his Mishnah Torah that there's a mitzvah to study nature to achieve Ahavas Hashem. And the Me'iri learns that that's Peshat in Al-Gemara, that one should study the, uh, the wonders of astronomy in order to see the, the, the incredible functioning of nature and the, how it functions in a clockwork, systematic manner. And therefore, presumably, this is where the Rambam lists the mitzvah. When the Rambam says, in the halachas of Avas Hashem, at the beginning of his Mishnah Torah, that one should study science to achieve Avas Hashem. And then the Rambam writes at great length about the science, including understanding of the astronomical bodies. This is where the Rambam lists this mitzvah of studying Chachmaschem or Vinaschem Be'ina Amim, includes this in the study of philosophy and science, which the Rambam believes was a mitzvah in order to achieve a love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So this is a, uh, another Mahalach in the Gemara, the Rambam and the Bahag his predecessor from the era of the Gonim, both agree that this is a mitzvah. However, they argue over whether this is a mitzvah, one of the 613 commandments, or not. So this is a... So, so, would, so Rabbi, would the Rambam then, we had a bit of a debate regarding, if it's not one of the 613, can it still be a mitzvah do writer? Um, uh, the answer is, in, in th there's, there's very briefly, because this is its own topic, and, and again, I would really encourage anyone who is interested in this, I, uh, in my Sunday morning show about 12 shiurim that go through what Jerobonans are and what Torah Shabbat pairs, and it's a really important topic um, that, that really any, anyone learning Torah should understand. Um, but very briefly, in our modern day, there's a semantics problem here. In our modern day terminology, the Rambam would say, yes, this is absolutely a Torah obligation. Things learned from Joshua are Torah obligation. However, the Rambam in this terminology labels that divri sofrim from the words of the Rabbanon, what we would call the Rabbanon. In other words, if we think of a spectrum, we have things which are explicitly from Hashem. These are explicit mitzvahs, Pesukim in the Torah. Then we have mitzvahs which are derived from Pesukim of Hashem by human research, by human understanding. But we translate them back into the Pesuk and believe this is what the Pesuk says. And then we have mitzvahs which are human, not interpretation, but innovation, which is what we call rabbinic mitzvahs. So we put the dividing line between God-given mitzvahs, whether explicit or interpreted, and we call those Torah law. And then the other side of the border is rabbinic law, which is rabbinic innovation. The Raman put the line elsewhere. The Raman calls Torah law as that which is explicit in the Pasuk. Human law is human-derived law from the Pasukim, which we would call in HaTorah. 
and human innovative law, which we would call rabbinic. So the Raman's nomenclature or semantics, it puts the, the use of language differently and labels mitzvahs derived from the Torah, but not explicit in the Torah as medivri sofrim as rabbinic, even though their force of the obligation is Torah, for example, with respect to sophic to arise or chumrah, when in doubt whether we have to go to the chomo or, or lenient sad. So this is a very, very brief summary of a, of a very complicated issue. Um, I'm happy if people are interested, just to give a one-off share to this cover about this topic, not, not connected to any sugya, but, but this is the, the view of the, uh, the Ramam. So this is the second shot in the Gemara. Um, very briefly, the, because we're running out of time, the Ramban um, leaps to the defense of the Bahag, and he says the Bahag didn't mean what the Ramam meant. The Bahag means um, if this is a mitzvah, if this is a proper mitzvah, it's referring to the mitzvah of Ibur Shonin, of creating a leap month, which indeed is connected to Tukufus and Mazolus, to seasons and zodiac. So the months of the year, Rosh Chodesh, is created by the new moon, and that is Kiddush HaChodesh, and that's connected to the moon. That's not what our Gemara is talking about. But the insertion of an extra month to the year is in order to ensure that the lunar year doesn't go out of sync with the solar year. So just very briefly to explain this concept, um, in the West, in uh, Christendom, a year is defined by the solar year, and others by the seasons, uh, a, a solar year is when the sun gets back to the same position in the sky and you've been through a full solar year. And this is a very useful way of running a year because it tells you what the seasons will be and when to plant the next crop in the ground and uh, when the time of harvesting and reaping is and so on and so forth. It's in line with the seasons of the year. In the Muslim world, we are aware they follow a lunar year, meaning to say that every month is determined by the length of the, of the monthly cycle of the moon and 12 such monthly cycles equals a year. Now, if you do that for one year, the two figures match. There's a discrepancy of about 11 days. However, if you continue doing this, over three years, there'll be about a month's difference. And over 33 year, over 40 years or so, there will be about a year's difference in, in, uh, in uh, things after about 35 years. 36 lunar years will have passed every 35 solar years. In Halacha, we merge the two. Why do we need to merge the two? Because a month is determined by the moon. A year has to be roughly in line with the solar year in order to ensure that Pesach remains in spring. And therefore, roughly one in three years, we add in an extra month, which is um, the second Adar month. How do we determine when to add that in? By watching the seasons. How do we determine the seasons? By the Tukufas, the seasons of the sun, and the Mazolus by the patterns of the stars. And therefore, the um, Ramban says what the Bahag means to say is that there are two separate mitzvahs. There isn't one mitzvah of the Jewish calendar, which is run by both Kitta Shachodesh by the monthly declaration of um, Rosh Chodesh through the moon, and by Ibo Hashara through the roughly once every three years insertion of an additional month. They're two separate mitzvahs according to the Bahag of watching the seasons for the monthly Ibo and watching the moon for the Kiddush Ha um, Chodesh. So says the Ramban in the Bahag. And then the Ramban says his own view is that there is a separate mitzvah to engage in understanding the Kufus and Azalas, as per Rashi, in order to know how the astronomical signs predict what the year will be like. But this isn't a mitzvah, this is a zeros. And when the Gemara calls it a mitzvah, it's, it's a sort of expansive language, but the truth is simply a zeros, an encouragement. It's a good thing to do is what the Gemara means. It's not a mitzvah, but it's an appropriate area to invest your energy into. It's a good way to grow and to create a Kiddush Hashem and so on and so forth. It's not technically a mitzvah. So this is the view of the Ramban. And again, I would encourage you to have a look at the very, very fascinating Ramban and Ramban inside. Um, just the last Peshat in the Sugya, which I didn't give a source for, is a third listing of mitzvahs. This is the smug, the Sefer Mitzvahs, the, 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 um, another Sefer Mitzvahs which was written um, by an Ashkenazi Rishon a couple of hundred years after the time of the Rambam, another very important mitzvah work. And the smug lists this as a mitzvah for a fourth explanation of what the mitzvah is. And he says he believes there is a mitzvah to run the calendar, which is the mitzvah of Kiddush Levana and of Kiddush Chodesh and Ibu Hashana. And there's a separate mitzvah to do the calculations behind that running of the calendar. And this is what our Gemara is referring to. So even though in the past, how did they run the calendar by witnesses and by watching the seasons, which was the way they did Kiddush HaChodesh and uh, um, Ibu Hashana. Nonetheless, there's a mitzvah for, based in at least, to be cognizant of the calculations and perhaps everyone to be cognizant of the calculations behind the calendar to understand how it works. And this is the mitzvah that our Gemara is referring to. 
Um, so I'll stop there because we've run out of time. But just as a summary of our sugya, we see a, a mysterious sugya that says you know, there's a mitzvah to do um, to know the tkufas and mazonas. Rashi learns this is a mitzvah to understand astronomical observations, as does uh, the Miyuch Sloran in the name of Rabbi Yonason. The Me'uri understands this to be the wonders of nature. The Rambam argues with the Bahag about whether this is a mitzvah min one of the 630 mitzvahs, or a mitzvah derived from a hermeneutical principle in reading Sukkim, but also seems to agree it's a mitzvah, and perhaps understands the mitzvah also to be understand the wonders of nature. The Ramban says this is a mitzvah of running the calendar. There's two mitzvahs in running the calendar, the, um, the monthly Rosh Chodesh and the yearly possible addition of an extra month. And then says that his own, own opinion is that the Bahag really needs to say it's a zeros. It's an encouragement. His own opinion is that it's a zeros. It's an encouragement rather than technically doing a mitzvah. And then the smug who says there's a mitzvah to understand the maths behind the calendar, not just a mitzvah to run the calendar. And with this, we conclude our sugya. And in Yitzhak Hashem, next week we will start, on Tuesday, we will start the um, get back to Hilta Shabbos and learn the sugya of um, Sod Tilazan. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, once again, thank you so much for joining.